the villanelle, an extremely complicated poetic form characterized by repetition, repetition of sounds that come in the end rhymes and repetition of lines, two of which are repeated several times throughout the poem. I'll go into the form in more detail in a second. A bit about the history. No one knows exactly how the Villanelle began. Uh, the name comes from Villanella, uh, which is Italian for a, a rustic song or dance. Uh, the word Villanella comes from Villain, which means peasant. So it's likely that the idea for the Villanelle um, originated in fieldwork, um, perhaps in a rural atmosphere, perhaps uh, workers singing during the harvest, during the plant, planting, and perhaps the singing was a sort of call and response or simply a highly repetitive sort of song. The first villanelle we have in verse, in written form, um, comes from a French poet of the 17th century named Jean Passerat. Um, and again, in 1606, he wrote a poem called um, I Have Lost My Turtle Dove. It's a love poem. Um, the turtle dove is not simply a bird, it's a beloved. And it takes exactly the form of the modern villanelle. Now, historians of poetry would call Passerat's villanelle a nonce form, meaning that when he used it, it was not a set form, but simply a form that he created one time <laughs> for one poem. And that form was not really taken up again until the late 19th century. And it is only then when the villanelle, as we now know it, solidified into a form that was repeated, a form that became conventional with particular rules the poet would follow if that poet were to write a villanelle. Now, um, a poet and historian of poetry, uh, Theodore de Banville, wrote an essay in 1872 on French poetry. And it was he who described the villanelle in detail and really helped to establish it as a form that a poet could use, just as a poet can use a sonnet, say, or just as a poet can use a sestina, for instance, or an ode. The, the villanelle became very popular in England in the late 19th century in what is often known as the decadent movement or the fin de siècle, the end of century movement, a movement characterized by someone like Oscar Wilde, a movement very keen on um, artifice, on the idea that art is superior to life, uh, that life is messy and stupid and silly and should not be taken that seriously, whereas all forms of art, from music to painting uh, to poetry, are what we should value most because art has nothing to do with life. Um, art should be made not to reflect life, not to imitate life, but art should simply be made for the sake of art. Art for art's sake. And that's where we get the phrase from. So Wilde wrote a villanelle, and other of his contemporaries wrote villanelles, um, to the point where when we get to the modernist age, the age of T.S. Eliot and Ezra Pound and Wallace Stevens and Robert Frost, poets that we've read, um, we actually see one of the most famous practitioners of modernist aesthetics, James Joyce, mock the villanelle in his Bildungsroman, or novel of development, called The Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. Well, the <clears throat> protagonist of that book, Stephen Dedalus, uh, writes a villanelle. And it appears that in that book, we're not meant to praise that villanelle, but see it as part of Stephen's immaturity as an artist. In any case, in the 1930s, suddenly there was interest in villanelles again. Uh, William Empson, W.H. Auden, um, just to name a few, uh, started uh, writing villanelles. Uh, but perhaps most famously, Dylan Thomas, the Welsh poet, died rather young, heavy drinker, wrote an elegy for his father called Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night. And this became a famous elegy. And not because of this, but certainly his, his um, Villanelle did make the style popular. 
Um, other poets, in turn, in English, started writing Villanelle. So you started seeing them more and more. Sylvia Plath wrote famous Villanelle. Um, one of the most famous Villanelles at all would be um, Elizabeth Bishop's One Art, which I'm going to talk to you about in just a minute. Now, why would you write a Villanelle? Well, again, in a couple of minutes, I'm going to tell you about how complicated it is to write one and how difficult it is to write one and how seemingly over the top it would be to write one. But the very repetition of the Villanelle, the repetition of rhymes and the repetition of lines, um, inspired one critic to say that the Villanelle is perfectly suited for a poet to explore obsession, uh, the, the rep repetition, fixation on one idea and an inability to let one idea go, the circularity one finds in obsessive behavior, doing the same thing over and over and over. And certainly we do see obsessive behavior in Sylvia Plath's Villanelle Mad Girl's Love Song. Another critic said that the Villanelle um, has to do with fatalism, the idea that, uh, yes, life is out of our control. Uh, life ultimately is probably not what we desire, and how best to accept it. Well, write a Villanelle, which kind of reflects the fatalism, the, uh, the idea that there's a set, rigid pattern in play that we are simply following, but oftentimes the poet will be ironic toward that form or, or, or rueful in meditating on how the poet is shaped by some kind of pattern, intricate pattern, set pattern, rigid pattern over which the poet has no control. So that's the second idea on the use of the villanelle or the value of the villanelle. Um, yet another critic says that the villanelle is ultimately a powerful vehicle for dealing with loss. And this is certainly what we see in Dylan Thomas's poem, Elegy to His Father, Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night. And it's certainly what we see in Elizabeth Bishop's poem, One Art, uh, an elegy um, for her lost mother, her dead mother. The repetition, while it can suggest monotony, while it can suggest fatalism, while it can suggest obsession, can also suggest recovery. The Villanelle is eminently a non-narrative form. It is, it is almost impossible to write a story in the Villanelle because the minute you want to move forward with your tale, you're repeating yourself again. So it's, it's, it's a form that is, is kind of about recovery. You say a sentence, and in most poems or in most stories, you would move on to another sentence, another, another. But in a villanelle, you say a sentence, and then that same sentence will be repeated a few lines down. Or you come up with a rhyme, and that rhyme will be repeated a few lines down. The idea being that when something seems to be past and gone, it's not. It keeps coming back. It keeps coming back. So one can see how this would be appropriate to elegy, which is a meditation on loss, the, the pain of loss, the pain of a loss of a loved one, and also a meditation on what remains behind. What, what do I have now to take the place of that loss? And the Villanelle might provide an opportunity to think about what might come back to replace what I've lost. So those are three different critics giving three different ways of thinking about the Villanelle. Now, the Villanelle, let's get down to it. The Villanelle is a 19-line poem. It is composed of five tercets, or three-line stanzas, plus one quatrain, or four-line stanza. So that's six stanzas in all. Now, the first quatrain has a rhyme scheme of A, B, A. The next quatrain has, I'm sorry, the first tercet has a rhyme scheme of A, B, A. The next tercet has a rhyme scheme of ABA. The next ABA. The next ABA. The next ABA. So that's five stanzas, five three line stanzas that have exactly the same rhyme scheme, which means you're only getting two rhyme sounds in those three stanzas.
you're getting the rhyming of the A's, that's one sound. You're getting the rhyming of the B's, that's one sound. So that's it. You're just getting two sounds of rhyme, end rhyme, in those first five tercets. Well, in the final quatrain, um, you get a rhyme scheme of A, B, A, A. So there again, you're only getting two sounds. So the rhyme scheme ends up being this. You get 13 A sounds and six B sounds. Again, these are the end rhyme sounds. So you have to have a lot of facility with a rhyme to come up with the rhyme schemes for the villanelle. Now, we'll look at example of, of this. This sounds kind of abstract now, I get it, but it'll all become clear when we start looking at Elizabeth Bishop's One Art, and I'll keep referring back to what I'm saying now. Now, the rhyme scheme, the rhyme sounds, the end rhyme sounds are not the only repetitions. It, get, it gets more complicated. The first line of the first stanza is repeated as the last line of stanza two and stanza four. The third line of the first stanza is repeated as the last line of stanzas three and stanzas five. And then the last two lines of the poem, the last two lines of the sixth stanza or the quatrain are the first line repeated followed by the third line repeated. So not only do you get repeated sounds in the end rhymes, you get repeated lines. So you can see that it's difficult to move forward with any kind of narrative in this poem. You're, there's a lot of repetition, which again makes the poem suitable for obsession or meditating on uh, how we're shaped by rigid patterns beyond our control or um, could be an appropriate form for an elegy. So let's have a look at a villanelle. So Elizabeth Bishop in 1976 wrote this poem, um, One Art. And here's what to notice, um, aside from the, the formal matters. On the one hand, the poem seems to be trying to take a sort of ironic attitude toward loss. Uh, over and over the poem says, the art of losing is not hard to master, as if somehow losing is something you would choose to do, and as if somehow losing is something that can be an elegant art form, that not only is something you would choose to do, but it's something you can choose to do well, so there's a kind of beauty to losing. Well, this is odd, because for most of us, losing is not an art at all. It's something that happens to us, over which we have very little control, or fear we have very little control. So there's an irony going through the poem where the poet seems to be saying that losing is not so terrible after all. Losing is a form of art form. And you know what? It's not that hard to master. That's a, there's a kind of effort to be detached, um, to, to push away from something in life that is difficult. Losing watches, losing loved ones. A second irony would be the fact that the villanelle itself is a form, as I've said, that suggests recovery. That once I've said a sentence or once I've said a line, normally um, that line would not be repeated in another poem or in a story. It would be gone, over, done. But in a villanelle, there's repetition. The line will be repeated again, as if whatever I lose will come back, as if whatever I will lose will come back. So that's the, what the form of the villanelle dramatizes. The idea that something said and done is not really said and done. Now, against those two elements of the poem, the ironic idea of losing is something that's easy, and the other idea that somehow we're, we don't really ever lose anything because everything's repeated, against that, we see little cracks in the form where the, where the poet will kind of break the rules of the villanelle, suggesting that life is messier than the rigid structure of the villanelle. And 
we'll also see not only through slant rhyme the poet does this, but but even through not following the the rules for refrain, um, suggesting that again her actual state is messier and more difficult than her desire for irony in her villanelle form suggest. And finally, we'll see her in the in the last quatrain, the last stanza use. Um, parenthetical remarks that sort of break an emotion into a poem that seems to be trying to be cool and detached. So instead of reading the whole poem at once, I'll just go through it stanza by stanza and I'll make comments as I go through. One art, Elizabeth Bishop. The art of losing isn't hard to master. So many things seem filled with the intent to be lost that their loss is no disaster. Tercet, master, A, disaster, A, intent, B. So there's the basic villanelle tercet. Um, master rhymes with disaster and intent is in the middle. Now what's the poet saying? That There's the irony here. The art of losing isn't hard to master. Well, I didn't think losing was an art. Losing is just something that happens to you. And it's painful. But no, it's just an art, and it's an easy art to master. There's this idea that she can somehow remove herself from the pain of loss. So many things want to be lost, she says. Well, is that true? Uh, do watches want to be lost? Do people want to be lost? There, so there's another technique here of the poet trying really hard not to feel the pain of loss, but suggesting that it, while well, losing things is an art, it's easy to master. And you know, a lot of things, they want to be lost anyway, so it's no big deal to lose them. Second tercet, uh, lose something every day, except the fluster of lost door keys, the hour badly spent. The art of losing isn't hard to master. So again, we have fluster and master here, which rhyme with disaster and master with, in the stanza before. And we have spent rhyming with intent from the stanza before. And we have the repetition of the first line as the last line of this stanza. The art of losing isn't hard to master is the first line of the poem. Here, the art of losing isn't hard to master is the last line of this stanza. <laughs> the poet is, is continuing to meditate on the ease of lost. Lose something every day. Um, that's odd. Is she saying we lose something every day or we should lose something every day? Is this a declarative or an imperative? Hard to tell. Except the fluster of lost keys. So there is a little fluster here. So that suggests that the art of losing isn't necessarily easy to master. When we lose things, we get flustered. There's no elegance and art and ease to that. Um, except the fluster of lost door keys, an hour badly spent. The art of losing isn't hard to master. So it's interesting here to note that the things being lost aren't that, aren't that important. Like door keys, some minor inconvenience, an hour badly spent. That's not hard at all. But even these tiny things can create fluster. So already the, the poet is showing a kind of emotion that doesn't show up in that first stanza. And also notice this, that fluster is not a perfect rhyme with master, disaster, and master. It's a slant rhyme, suggesting that there's a little crack in, in the form already, that, that this tight villanelle form might not be able to hold the emotion that the poet is here expressing. Stanza three. Then practice losing farther, losing faster, places and names and where it was you meant to travel. None of these will bring disaster. So you have faster, disaster and faster, rhyming with master, fluster, disaster and master. And you have meant rhyming with spent and intent. So you see you're getting a lot of that repetition here. And the last line of the first stanza to be lost, to be lost that their loss is no disaster, is here varied a little bit. Notice that in, in, in a conventional villanelle, this last line of the third stanza would be an exact repetition of the last line of the first stanza, but here it's not. To be lost that their loss is no disaster, the last line of the first stanza, is repeated a little bit when Bishop says, to travel, none of these will bring disaster. So she's really swerving from the traditional Villanelle form here. 
suggesting again that the villanelle form can't quite hold the emotion that she's trying to constrain here. Um, the idea that you can practice losing further, as if you're intending to lose things. Oh, uh, and lose other things, Lo lose places, lose names. Oh, okay, that's not a big deal. Um, I'm trying to think of the place where we went in Europe. I can't remember it. No big deal. Oh, I can't remember the name of the, my teacher in the first grade. No big deal. And where it was you meant to travel. Well, that's odd. Um, where we meant to travel. We didn't travel there, but we might have traveled there. Um, so, so that's a little discombobulating here. There, there's not a sense of, okay, uh, practice losing things that actually occurred and you don't remember them, but also practice losing things that never occurred, but that you meant to do them. So there's this discombobulating take on, on time there. And we continue. Um, I lost my mother's watch and look. My last or next to last of three loved houses went. The art of losing isn't hard to master. So again, we have the, the, the A, B, A. I won't go back through and make all the rhyme sounds again. You get the picture by now. But look at this weird rhyme. I lost my mother's watch and look, my last or, my last or rhymes with master. Now that's very awkward rhyme, suggesting that some connections being severed here. The rhyme is very faint, very slight. There's something being severed here. There's something falling apart here because now there's something very inconsequential to be lost. Not a place where you might have gone, not a name, not a place you went, but the watch of a mother. And look, my last or next to last of three loved houses went. The art of losing isn't hard to master. So not only she lost her mother's watch, which could be very sentimental, but also she's lost a house. How did that happen? So these are big things. So when she comes in saying the art of losing isn't hard to master, do we really believe her now? There seems to be incongruity between what she's losing and saying, oh, that's not a big deal. And I think the my last door and masters shows this incongruity. I lost two cities, lovely ones, and vaster, some realms I owned, two rivers and a continent. I missed them, but it wasn't a disaster. Again, the stakes are even higher. Losing two cities, lovely ones. That's a lot to lose. Uh, lost them by moving away from them, perhaps. And vaster, some realms I owned. Well, what does that mean? To own a realm, is this, is this poet some kind of great landowner? It doesn't seem so, but maybe ownership in the terms of I own them as, as an emotional place or I own them a kind of imaginatively. Two rivers, a continent. These are big things. I missed them, but it wasn't a disaster. See, there's that incongruity again. Surely it's a disaster to, to lose such big things. And here comes the last stanza, which is a quatrain. Um, and remember uh, that the rhyme scheme is A, B, A, A, and the last two lines will be the first line of the first stanza and the last line of the first stanza. Now, here we have some parenthetical expressions that really break in to the poet's seeming desire to remain cool and calm in the face of some kind of terrible loss. Even losing you, the joking voice, a gesture I love, I shan't have lied. It's evident the art of losing is not too hard to master, though it may look like, write it like disaster. Even losing you, who's this you? We don't know. We can imagine if we know Bishop's, autobi Bishop's biography that it's her mother, deeply committed to her mother. Her mother died when she was 18. Even losing you, and then a parenthetical expression, the joking voice, a gesture I love. So look at that specificity, losing you, and what, 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 do, I, what do I miss most about you? Uh, your joking voice. How lovely. A gesture I love. So this is something you do not want to lose. Even losing you. The joking voice. A gesture I love. Close parentheses. I shan't have lied. Even losing you, I shan't have lied. Lied about what? Well, the possibility exists here that she could be possibly lying. So this is, a, this is a moment the poem suggests that she's just really protesting too much. All along she's saying, 
it's easy to lose stuff is kind of a lie because it's very hard to lose stuff. It's evident the art of losing is not too hard to master. Well, that's not true now. We know that. But notice she's really emphasizing. It's evident that it's easy to lose stuff. It's evident the art of losing is not too hard to master. We lose stuff all the time, and that's not too hard. It's evident that it's not too hard. But it's like she's straining to say, oh, no, no, it, 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 it's evident, right? When clearly there's another current in the poem that's saying, no, it's not. That I'm, I've lost something that affects me terribly. And this poem, my effort to try to soothe myself, as it were, is not working. Though it may look like, and here's another parenthesis, write it. And write is in italics. Though it may look like, write it, like disaster. Write what? Losing you, the you here looks, looks like disaster. Um, earlier, she said, it's not a disaster. It's not a disaster in various ways, right? She's not saying the line verbatim. Um, it's not really a disaster to lose things. It's not really a disaster to lose things. Here she's saying, it's not hard to lose things, though it might look like a disaster. And she uses the word like twice. So there's kind of a breakdown in grammar here. If I take the parentheses out, um, though it may look like, like disaster. So the very syntax is falling apart here. And the fact that Bishop says, write it with an exclamation point and write in italics in that parentheses suggests that she's making herself write the word disaster um, in a way that she hasn't written it before. So there are other hints that this poem is, is about a villanelle falling apart, aside from the variations in rhyme, and, or, or the, the swerves in rhyme, I should say, and the swerves in repetition of, of lines. Most villanelles are written in 10-syllable stanzas. Most are, in fact, written in, I'm sorry, not stanzas, in 10-syllable lines. Most are iambic pentameter. Well, almost all of Bishop's lines are 11 syllables. Some of them scan iambic, but the, the, in all the, the A rhymes, the master, vaster, disaster, the ER is the final syllable, and it's an, an 11th syllable. Um, it's known as a hypermetric, meaning that there's an extra syllable added to what would normally be a 10-syllable iambic pentameter line. And this... An unaccented additional syllable is known as a feminine ending. And feminine endings often give a feeling of like trailing off, of, of unsure, of, of, of a lack of certainty. So th that's a way I think that Bishop, even metrically, is suggesting doubt. So the tension in this poem, in the tension in this poem is between the poet saying, no big deal to lose things, not a disaster, and look at this poetic form where things keep coming back, coming back, coming back. That's one force. And the counter force is, oh, look how these this poetic form is falling apart here with this odd rhyme or falling apart here with this variation on what should be repeated verbatim and falling apart in that there's the, the, the lines themselves are not emphatic, but they kind of trail off in doubt. So that is a villanelle.